Hey, everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by SoundCloud Studios. Visit online at soundcloudstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. SoundCloud Studios is the answer. SoundCloud Studios offers fast, affordable, custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at soundcloudstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studio. Take your image to the next level. Also, time to give an official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international war ring author Mia Molson Zia. If you love fast paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia Molson Zia. Available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing is fast paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. Takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is an illusion and those you love will be the first to go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson Zia has garnered great reviews and Eve 11 endorsed by Howard celebrities, including Joanna Cassie, Forge Riley, and many others. So grab your copy today, Four Girls Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com on over 30 podcast platforms, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also, Anchor FM, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Audible, Apple Music, and more. Take the Mike Widener Show with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Follow the Mike Widener Show on Instagram and Twitter today. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, tote bags makes great gifts 24-7. Amazon.com, check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia for great books like Missing, Once and Wrinkles, also cool merchandise, t-shirts, pop sockets, throw pills, hoodies, phone cases, and more. Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia. Check it out today. Also support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, and the Mike Widener Show.com. Make sure you do so today. Well, here are the terrific gentleman who's a writer, TV, radio reporter, and producer who's called um, New York City, the Queens area, his home for over 30 years. Worked at number of stations like WOR, WINS, WBGO, CNBC, also MSNBC, and a lot more. He also wrote hundreds of poems and um, has read them um, over a number of years at the famed uh, Cornelius Street Cafe with famed classic composer, conductor, and multi-instrumentalist uh, David Amram, actor John uh, Bentimig, and uh, also a lot more, Bentiglio, so uh, talk about that, poet Frank Messing, and uh, he's also been a featured poet uh, in uh, Brooklyn Beat uh, Laureate's uh, Brooklyn Poetry Outreach in Park Slope, uh, Brooklyn. He's got a new book, of uh, a collection of uh, interconnected uh, vignettes and um, of street level, um, street level gays in uh, Queens and New York City, offbeat tradition of uh, Henry Miller, Charles Bukowski in a three-part novel. We'll talk about the slow midnight on Cypress Avenue. And of course, you know, his amazing career in uh, New York media. Live, ladies and gentlemen, from the Plus Studio, somewhere in the East Coast in a New York state of mind, you know, going back and forth and everything else. For, for over 30 years, he's been the proud of New York. Ladies and gentlemen, writer, TV, radio reporter, producer, and the author of the new book, The Slow Midnight on Cypress Avenue, published by Permita Press, Mike Figliola, are best known as The Freaking Fig. Figs, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Mike, thank you so much for having me. Let me tell you, I got to get a Mike Wagner pillow because I'm not sure I can go to sleep tonight unless I get one of those. <laughs> oh, you know something? Here, here. <laughs> what, what have you, um, you know, just picture, picture. That is, picture. let me tell you, that is sweet dreams. I'm <laughs> 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 hey, you know something? I mean, no, it's can, really cool, man. That's awesome. It does. Yeah, yeah it's a hot yeah. seller and you can sleep with me anytime, you know, not me physically, <laughs> but that thing. Right. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> even over. my dog slept on it. You know, <laughs> if, if you had cats, I could sleep on it. You they get might, everybody, you know, all types, everyone's sleeping on that thing. That's yes, that's <laughs> right. And, and we'll send you a link too and go ahead and order and go ahead yeah, and cool. uh, order for your hundreds of friends. So, oh my God, yep. you'll definitely sleep good tonight. I'm glad you saw <laughs> <laughs> A belated Valentine's gift. Absolutely. I'm, oh, I'm yeah. It. And of course, you know, got Easter, you got Christmas and whatever else. So it makes a great gift. So, yeah. I, I mean, you just, you're an amazing guy, writer, TV, radio reporter, producer, who's called New York City and the Queens area home for over 30 years, we worked in a number of stations. You wrote hundreds of poems. You also had them read. You also been to a number of, um, you know, Beat Street cafes and more have been featured yeah. um, with quite a few uh, artists as well, too. You have a new book, which is a collection of uh, interconnected vignettes called The Slow Midnight on Cypress Avenue, published by Permita Press. And the uh, word is you've got another book out. But first, let's talk about your book and talk about your amazing career. And before getting all that figs, tell us how you first got started. 
Yeah, Mike, Mike, thank you so much again for having me here. So yeah, you know, um, to, to go back, uh, you know, backtrack a little to what you, you, you first brought up, the radio career is really where I started. You know, I think um, when I was a kid, my mom and dad are, are New Yorkers through and through. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad's from Brooklyn, my mom's from Brooklyn. And the funny thing is I always tell this story, you sort of emigrate from Brooklyn to Queens. Now, most people don't, you know, if you don't know about New York City, you know, Brooklyn is the borough adjacent to Queens. And, 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 you know, they sort of move on, you know, like the Jeffersons, they move on up, you know, you kind of move on up to Queens and, and kind of leave a little bit, you know, when things get a little dicey in those areas, they move into Queens. So they both, my mom's from Bushwick, my dad's from Williamsburg, and uh, they moved into Queens. So, you know, for me to write about the area I'm writing about, which is Cypress Avenue, that's a thoroughfare, a long a avenue that straddles Brooklyn and Queens. And, and that area there is very much a mis kind of a mishmash of, of folks. You know, you have the stalwarts that are still there forever, you know, and then you have the, the kind of the, the, the new breed of folks that came in there, it's sort of these hippies, if you want to say, or mm -hmm. whatever you want to call them. And then you have the transients, and then you have sort, sort of um, another population of immigrants and, and other folks who, who are trying to make their way. And that really resonated with me when I when I thought about writing the book. But where, where, you know, that's really where I come from. You know, my mom was a homemaker. My dad's a cop. My uh, my grandfather was in the World War II Navy gunner. Uh, wow. He told stories about that. Um, I'm from truckers and cabby drivers, blue collar folk, right? R real regular people. So that is what is important to me in my prose. A lot of people, um, you know, they kind of write about Broadway or they write about Wall Street. Or they write about, you know, Williamsburg, where the, you know, the, sort of the the, um, the happening places now, you know. But I like to write about Cypress Avenue and, and the people that live there, you know. And so when I went down, we went back to my roots and started, you know, a lot of my family's still living there, and some of them, you know, they moved away, but you know, in, in later years, but they were living there and they used to spend time there. Um, when I went back to research, what really spoke to me was the people waiting at the bus stop. Mm. The, 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 the guy sitting on the stoop, sort of with like every day sitting there. I walk by the same guy every day sitting there, you know, and, and so he had to be included in my book. And oh. to me, th those are folks that are the forgotten. People are not written about um, or really heralded. And so I wanted to make a book that was palatable to not just New Yorkers, but to anybody across, you know, even the Rust Belt, St. Louis, um, Cincinnati, Niagara Falls, I don't care where you are, but I think it's about a neighborhood. It's about people struggling, trying to get ahead. It's a darker, it's a darker look at it. But I think at the end of the day, I think we're all in on, on that. And so what was important to me was to write about those folks. And, and um, it's from where I'm from. And that's, that's what I tried to translate on the page. Mm -hmm. And you also done some radio as well, too, which is also yeah. part of your roots, too. You know, you all been yeah. for a long time. You work just yeah. about every station out there. W-O-R, W-I-N-S, W-B-G-O. You also worked with yeah. CNBC, MSNBC. And, um, you, you know, I mean, how'd you get first started in radio? So it's like just a lot of us got started radio, not just with this, not just with that. But, you know, there's always some form of um, getting started in radio. Like, you know, everybody's got a story in radio. I got to tell you that, so... I'm so lucky that I, I started in radio. I think that's really what, what propelled me to where I am today in my producing and, and professional career outside of my writing. Uh, WOR is one of the oldest stations in, in the nation. I mean, I actually got to work for John Gambling, which is one of the original uh, talk morning show radio hosts here. His father and grandfather, they all, is a lineage of gamblings that did this since like 1930, you know? Wow. And I got to be a part of that really lucky I'm really lucky and blessed to, to do that. Um, I worked at, yeah, 1010 Wins. I got to work there for a year or so and got to, got to do that. And WBGO, which is a um, jazz NPR kind of station, a public mm. broadcasting station in, um, in, uh, in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, they gave me my first stint as a reporter. So, you know, all of these things, again, and, you know, it, you don't get to do that. And you don't get to do experience all of this kind of stuff in other genres, you know, in radio, they really give you the, the tools and the ability, to, like, try it out, kid. Let's see what you can do. Come on, guy, give me a pat on the back, get in there. You know, <laughs> the, you know, get in there, get in there, rock, you know, go ahead. So, 
I was really lucky to, to get that uh, opportunity. Radio has been a blessing for me. I, I have an affinity for it. I wish it was better right now. I know a lot of oh, folks my are gosh. radio. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you I mean, you radio still or yeah, ra yeah. Ra radio veterans. Uh, we all yeah. agree on that one. I've been yeah. doing it since 1982. I've uh, been yeah. in uh, greater Chicago, Southern Illinois. I've been in Milwaukee. Yeah. I've been in Bismarck, yeah. North Dakota since um, 2007 working, you know, at quite a few stations. So I know how that yeah. goes. And, um, and of course, we can talk about this another time as well. But um, you, you know, you got to live, breathe, and everything else. But then you talk about being a reporter. What was that first story that you did? And uh, tell us about that. <laughs> Great question. It's a funny one. Uh, so um, I'm I'm literally green. Uh, I've, I've done this maybe a couple months, and all of a sudden we get an alert. And again, at the time, now this is 2000. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, 20 years ago, you know, so I know I don't look it, but it was 20 years ago. <laughs> you know, I was a little, a, a little jerk then, <laughs> whatever little guy. And I, was I think many of us were little jerks back thing. then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, and so we get an alert that some maniac climbed up the Brooklyn Bridge and he climbed really? up. The, he climbed the Brooklyn Bridge. They were calling him the Spider-Man. You can Google oh, this. Oh, yes, the, yes. The Spider-Man right. guy. What, what Was that that French guy that um, was uh, climbing it? Was that the Spider-Man or am I thinking of Not another this, guy? That was a different time. This is late. That was later. Oh, this wow. This is like the original Spider-Man guy. And so if you Google it, I think it was like 2001, maybe 2000, right before 9-11. So this guy somehow got up to, to <laughs> climb this, the, the, uh, the spires and went all the way up and the police had to come. And so I'm standing there now. I have never done this before. So I had to go and go live and report and give feedback and tell the anchors. I had never done it. I was scared. I had no idea what I was. I think I even <laughs> said I was at the wrong place at one point. <laughs> uh, the, best, the best part of the story is, and I think you'll like this, was that the, uh, the, the police showed up, obviously, and they were all trying to talk them down. And some guy brought a Heineken and said, hey, now if I give you the Heineken, will you come down? At least ha grab the Heineken, you know, the guy <laughs> grabbed the Heineken and they grabbed him off the, off the, um, the, uh, whatever, whatever scaffolding he was on and they brought him down. So yeah, oh that, my was, gosh. that was my first, uh, real radio. Oh story. my gosh. That would have been a great deal too. It's like throwing a slice of New York pizza. And I think he would have <laughs> got down a lot faster. You know, go down in record time. So <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, I can imagine if I did something like that in radio, like, Oh my God, this is a travesty. It made yeah. me think of go back to the Hindenburg as well too, with that, guy from WLS was in 1932 <laughs> and he's like oh, oh my man. god the calamity <laughs> the devastation <laughs> and of course right. you know me being calm it's just like you know okay well the zeppelin's yeah. on fire what are you gonna do about <laughs> it it's like you know okay right. it's like you're gonna jump out or you know i mean i was watching about the whole thing about the uh, hindenburg and they said there was like some malfunctions it was just you know poor design and everything else i was thinking about that but of course you know i'll share my story about an alert as well too that I was going to school at southern illinois university in carbondale everybody says party school but i was there just to really learn uh broadcasting for a couple of years going to a, a a junior school and um here you know teletypes you know i think you'll click 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 sure. click click yeah you, know, you see on cbs nbc abc the lou grant show right. wkrp right. and all that and then mm -hmm. here comes the thing you know, ding 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 and I was a shift producer and I mentioned one of the news guys, oh, oh it's dingy. And it says, um, it had to do with the challenger, you know, with, um, you know, Chris McCoff and the whole crew, you know, the, the cha space challenger explosion. And it said the space wow. challenger exploded. And I read the space challenger exploded. I says, you better read this. And he looked, he went, holy shit, it exploded. And everybody came running into the room and a news director wow. was like, you know, throwing people out of the way, get on the air, get this on the air. And that I was remember your first that, big story? That was, yeah. Wow. It was just like, you know, oh my I, I was basically just a, a producer and yeah. here I was and I looked at it and I went, you better read this and verify. We're taught to verify. That's the whole thing with the reporters. You have to verify. Even if your mother says, I love you, you have to verify. So I said, <laughs> You sure. better verify this and make sure. And he was like, <laughs> and everybody came flooding in. I almost got trampled that day. So that was my big one right there too. So, <laughs> and of course, you know, yeah. getting, you know, getting back to tragedies as well too, and all the big events. And um, where were you at the time during the uh, world trade, world trade bombing on 9-11? Another great question. Um, I don't get asked this much, which is, which is weird because, you know, like, like I just told you, like, so I started, um, my career in 2000 at WOR Radio. And um, 
the day of 9-11, this is so weird. This is going to be a weird story. I, I don't think I've told it on the air or anywhere. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I've told friends, but I've not, not actually spoke about it. So I was supposed to meet the press van at City Hall on 9-11. Wow. And the press van was going to take me to an event with then Mayor Rudy Giuliani. And he was at a some sort of kind of vanilla event. It was sort of like a, eh, you know, if you don't make it, who cares kind of thing and whatever. And, oh, you can, you can always get sound later. You always had people that, you, you know, in, in the new news business, you know this, or, or the radio or TV business, you have people you can, you know, okay, can I get the sound? You got it early, I missed something or whatever. That was how it was, you know? So I knew if I didn't make this press van and I didn't go to the event that Giuliani said nothing at, the only thing they were going to ask him was, you know, about his divorce with, at the time, Donna Hanover or whatever. It was some kind of like mundane stuff. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, you know, whatever. And I had gone out with some friends the night before and I said, yeah, when I get up, I'll, I'll go, I'll show up late. I, I don't need the press van. And so I was living at home. I was with my parents. I was 20 years old, living with my parents at the time. And so I come down the stairs, kind of dressed or whatever. And my father says, hey, you better call your job. A small plane had just crashed into the the trade center. Now, had I been down there at 830, let's say, I would have been at City Hall, which is less than, um, I don't know, maybe a mile and a half from where the trade center once stood. I would have, I would have had to go to, I might have, I don't know what would have happened that day, mm. um, but I avoided that by the, you know, somebody was looking out for me. I believe that. And, um, you know, again, I feel bad for everybody else I had to be down there and, and, and do all that, but I missed that. The next day, the 12th, I was down there and the things I've seen were, were awful, you know, um, stuff that I don't like to think about too much or talk about too much, but you could imagine the streets were ash and white from the uh, buildings that had collapsed. There were um, very unsightly things all over the place. And there was a lot of quiet. And that was the weirdest part to me, Mike, the quiet, the quiet in lower Manhattan, which didn't, Manhattan is never quiet. So the fact that it was deathly, eerily, disturbingly quiet was what really resonated with me the most. And I knew the world had changed forever at that point wow so that was my that's my 9-11 story yeah mm-hmm. it's weird i've never told it and uh, there you go and what happened to the people in the van going to city hall they had already headed out they weren't going to city hall they were being picked up at city hall to go to this event with m- the mayor with I-, I don't remember where he was i think it was um it might have been in, in brooklyn i don't know where it was exactly except that i know that they they had gone there and he got back somehow and, and then headed to the site. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, weird, right? Crazy story. <clears throat> that was, yeah. And of course, you know, you, you talk about being sick, hungover and everything else, you know, you know, I, my family was not involved in any way, shape or form, but I did work with a couple of people whose um, family members and associates were, were indirectly involved. And I had a guy worked with um, his second cousin worked as an accountant um, in, in the trade and he called in sick. And his uh, replacement show, wow. and we found out that the that the trade went down. His replacement uh, went with it, and he really felt bad. And then there was another uh, family that I associated with, and um, they're looking for this big um, multi million dollar deal. They're up in the uh, 120th, and um, they're they're like this close to uh, closing the deal. And by the time they're getting ready to close the deal, dead. The Jeez. phones went dead, and of course, you know, so so the. Um, the, the whole business. And I thought, wow, it's like everything did change on 9-11. I have to say that. So this is one of some of the new stories as well, too. And um, you know, talk about getting started in 2001 and more as well, too. And um, we'll also talk about uh, getting more into radio. We'll talk about, um, you know, poetry as well, too. You wrote about it. And we'll talk about your book, The Slow Midnight on Cypher's Avenue. But first, listen to the Mike Widener Show at the Show.com, powered by SoundWeb Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all you need. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. It's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Widener Show. Get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give official shout out to our official sponsor, of the Mike Widener Show, International Warring Author Mia Molson Zia. 
If you love fast paced mysteries, you love Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon in paperback and ebook. Missing is fast paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is an illusion and those you love will be the first to go missing. It's available on Amazon in paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson Zia has garnered great reviews and Eve Eleven endorsed by Howard's celebrities, including Joanna Cassidy, Forge Riley, and many others. So grab your copy today for Girls Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show on over 30 podcast platforms. Take the Mike Widener Show at the end on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Follow the Mike Widener Show on Instagram and Twitter today. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia. For great books, merchandise, and more, Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia. And don't forget to check out... Uh, support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, and the Mike Widener Show.com. Make sure you give generously today. We're here with the amazing writer, TV, radio reporter, and producer out of uh, New York City in the Queens area for over 30 years and the author of the new book, The Slow Midnight on Cypress Avenue by Primitive Press, Mike Figliola, best known as a freaking fig here on the Mike Widener Show. Figs. And you also wrote some poetry as well, too, besides some uh, stories. And um, maybe before we get some of your poetry, and uh, what are some more interesting stories that you've done? And maybe like, a really funny story you did in the news business, like something that was like really unusual. <laughs> God, there's, there's so many. I mean, you, you know, when you work in New York, you really never know who you're going to come across, right? I mean, it's it's just, I remember in 2011, we interviewed some guy that said the world was going to end. He was wearing a sign or something. <laughs> you know, the world's ending today. And uh, I don't know, he had some fo- cult following. Uh, that was weird. You, you, you know what else was really strange? Hurricane Sandy. Oh, a, yes. Yeah. And, and let me tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things that, you know, it's not as funny as that, you know, it's a little bizarre kind of thing. But I, I'll tell you when um, I did Hurricane Sandy, we did not shut down. WR stayed open the entire time, although we were in the flood zone. So Manhattan had flood zones, believe it or not. Um, they were like, we, you know, which is probably going to be the reality on the go forward. But um, lower Manhattan, which is where WR Studios had moved from. So WR was at 1440 Broadway for like a hundred years. I mean, you're talking like Gene Shepard broadcasted back there. You know, that was that was where he broadcasted from. We moved down to 111 Broadway. I, I actually had worked at 1440. We had moved down to 111. And that was a Wall Street area. Oh, and wow. so that day we all, we, like you had to come in. They, they told me, you, know, you, you sleep in your studio. You know, we'll, we'll provide whatever we can for you. But mm. stay over, don't leave because we have... We're the first line of defense here, you know, in New York, we have to tell everybody what's going on. Everyone saw their radios or some kind of ham radio or some sort of whatever. And um, we stayed, and I'll tell you, in the middle of the night, I went down the stairs, got up, you know, I couldn't sleep and I was tired, it was days. And I went down into the Whitehall train station. Now Whitehall is one of the last stops in lower Manhattan before you, before you, um, uh, it goes underground again and heads back into Brooklyn, I guess. Anyway, when I, I went down the stairs and there was a river of water, I'm telling you a river coming through the tunnel where the train would be, it was a river. Wow. And I watched it and I looked at it and I got scared. <laughs> I said, oh my God, Gosh. what is this? <laughs> and I went up going back upstairs and said to my friend who was waiting at the top, do not go down there. This is getting flooded. There was a river going through and he went down anyway. But the point is, he, I, I still told him not to go. He went, looked at it for himself, and he knew this was bad news. So, yes, yeah, Sandy, that was a wild, wild story um, in, in radio that, that I, you know, I, I lived through, I worked through, and I'm glad I did, you know. And, and you know, radio, radio's a funny thing. Like, it's, there's so many um, uh, avenues you can go down, you know, where there's stuff where you report on scene. There's stuff where you just do things. Here's another funny, crazy story that I did. The, uh, remember the Boston Bomber, that crazy guy up in the two brothers up in Boston. Oh yeah, I remember the Boston Marathon. Bomber. Oh my Marathon God, guys. yeah. Mm-hmm. I I cold called a neighbor that was. I I found out that they 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 thought the Boston one of the brothers was on the street. Called her and said, "Hey, you know what's going on in your block?" She got her on the phone. She, I said, "Would you go on the air?" She got on the air, and as she was on the air, she said, "Oh my God, a SWAT team is coming down the street." Ooh. It was such a weird. <laughs> Right? And she's, it was happening real time. And they ended up finding the brother, uh, I forget his name, uh, Zarnayev or whatever, uh, in one of the, in one of the backyards mm-hmm. on that. So yeah, you know, radio is great. And it's a medium you can't, 
you can't do it with anything else. And it's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm blessed to, to have been a part of it. And certainly a lot of fun, too. And you also write some uh, poems as well, too, and, and had them featured. And also with some great people. And uh, tell us some about it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've, I've always believed in reading poetry live. I think it's a great thing. Um, I, I, I started as a poet, you know, uh, basically that's where every, the, the slow midnight on Cypress Avenue, my book that we've been talking about, that came from a poem that I wrote. It's funny the one of these, these guys I, I read with said, Hey, if you don't turn that book into a, that title, the slow midnight on Cypress Avenue into a book, I'm going to do it. And I said, Oh, geez, I better, better get out this thing. You know, he's, he was, he's a writer. He's good. You know, so uh, he was right. It was a good, great call. And, uh, you know, per, you know, uh, Permuta Press came calling afterwards, but um, yeah, you know, I've read it some great places. I've read with John Ventimiglia, who you mentioned earlier, who's a Sopranos. He's he's in the Sopranos. He plays Artie Bucco. Mm-hmm. I got to read with him. Uh, David Amram, who's a a uh, j- very close friend of Jack Kerouac, who came from the Beat Generation. Mm-hmm. Uh, he invited me to do that. Kevin Twig, who's a very famous jazz drummer, and so I I got to do this live on stage at the Cornelia Street Cafe, uh, which you mentioned earlier as well, which is a um, it's not there anymore. It closed down, unfortunately, like a lot of places in New York, especially with the pandemic. Um, so I, I got to do that. I was lucky to do that. And um, poetry is, you know, my first love. I think that if I could write it forever, it gives you a little chance to kind of scream a little and 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 get your get your get it all out. And then when you go to the novel writing, you have to kind of hone yourself a little and make it sort of coherent. <laughs> you know, you can't just scream and yell, yeah. You know, but but with the novel is a little different, but. Poetry has been a big deal. And um, I got a writing scholarship when I went to, to um, uh, my my college on poetry. So nice. yeah, it's been very connected with my life. Yeah. Very nice too. And of course, um, you also had that you. book, The Slow Midnight on Cypress Avenue and uh, broken into three parts, morning, afternoon, mm-hmm. and night. And you got yeah. some uh, great characters in there. You got uh, Samuel Jean. You also got Desponda Dizzy Riviera and also uh, Oldie Goldie Samuels. I love that name. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just tell us about uh, a bit about it, especially morning, afternoon, night. And, um, you know, just yeah. like a little bit of stories here, there, everything. And, um, you know, sure. just maybe a little bit of true stories. And, um, you know, just go ahead and share away with us. It's like, I, I wish I was in New York right now with you, just taking in, you know, <laughs> with a big old New York slice pizza and everything like that. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I, you know, it's, uh, again, thank you for that. Uh, it's the characters are built on experiences and people I've met and, um, you know, they're not based on one person. Uh, old Goldie Samuels is somebody that I based it on a couple different people. Um, but, you know, she's sort of like the, the neighborhood old woman who kind of like, spin some yarns and spends time at the, the liquor store and, and you'll see her at the grocery store and you'll see her you'll see her all over the place and she's she's one of those folks um you, you know when I what I really tr- like I said earlier uh when when we first started the interview I really want to write about regular folks so you know Desi is a little a Puerto Rican girl who lives at home with her mother and she's sort of broke and she doesn't know where her life is heading and she hangs out with this old guy um, Sam Jean, who's sort of like a father figure to her because she never had a father. Mm-hmm. And they have this weird relationship, you know, where, you know, she kind of shows up and he's kind of grumpy and mi- miserly and she's happy to be there, but he's not happy to be there, happy for her to be there. But all of a sudden she leaves and he wants her back. It's sort of, it, it's sort of like this, this dichotomy. Of course, that I yes. mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, of, of, you know, people who need each other, but try to pretend that they don't. But I think that's kind of how society is, right? Like, even with your friends sometimes, you know, I- I'm sure you have these friends who are like, oh, you know, it'd be great to hang out. Good to see. You. And then you don't hear from them anymore. But then they get kind of pissed if you don't talk to them for a while. You know, so I, I-, I-, I kind of try to capture that. Um, and I really want an-, an authentic look at Ridgewood and Queens and Cypress Avenue and these folks, because I want them to be the anti-Broadway, the anti-Wall Street, the anti-Midtown. Mm. The, the ante anywhere. I wanted them to be the regular people. Desi doesn't have, has pocket change. She uses a pay phone, stuff like that. Like that was important to me to get in there. Like they talk about ash cans and things that, you know, like sort of yesteryear talk, which uh-huh. is important to me. You know, I think that's, it's, it's, it's still around, but um, people don't pay much mind to it. And I wanted to highlight that. 
and make mm -hmm. sure we put it back in the forefront of the book. Mm -hmm. And what do you feel is the overall message of the book? Um, I, I think that we're all neighbors and we're all interconnected at the end of the day. And I think that, you know, when I grew up, my, when there was a blackout on my street, I, I know, again, I don't, I don't know where you grew up, but either way, when the lights went out at night or blackout went out, my parents would sit on the stoop or a stoop, it might be your porch or your, you know, your walk, your stepway, whatever. We would sit out there. My mom would have a cup of coffee. My dad would sit out there and we'd send us out to play. That doesn't exist anymore. And I was hoping this book would be a love letter to that sort of time and, and place where people spend time outside and looking at each other. And, you know, I don't see kids playing out on the street anymore at all. Oh, that my gosh. Oh, right. I mean, does it bother you? <laughs> it, it's sad. I have, I have four kids myself. They're all grown. Yeah. And, um, you know, whenever we get a chance, free time and everything, I always took them to the parks. We always hung out outside. Nowadays, yeah. with all the, um, the stuff that's going on, you know, kids just, you know, they they revert to their phones, their uh, laptops, yeah. iPhones, and um, Fitbits, every gadget out there. Right. So it's just like, you only see playgrounds out there anymore. If they're on a playground, they're always like, you know, play with their apps, tax, everything yeah. like that. It's like, yeah, it, it is really sad. And then I look at it, it's just like, I remember days where it's like, especially on Saturday nights in the summer, you were never in the house. You all, you had to be outside. You play right. ball until like sunset. You had and that's like not because party. you had a bad home life. That's because you enjoyed being outside. Me too. I, you know, I, my mom and dad loved, they said, go out and have a good time. I knew when to come home, you know, but, but the kids today, they're not out there doing that, which I know. I, I, I think that's unfortunate. I really mm -hmm. do. And, and that is rather sad too. And of course, you're right. It's just encouraging people to um to get out there when they have a book and everything. And what was the most challenging part about the book for you? Um, you know, I, I think I think for me, so I wrote it in vignette form. And um the challenging part of that was writing in all these different voices. So I write in a Southern Baptist minister voice, which I had to really work at. It really took a long time to do. I also write these two um, at, um, coming of age adolescent girls. They, they decide to, I don't want to give too much away. They decide to, to, to reconsider their life on Cypress Avenue because they realize it's going nowhere. And so to write in those voices was really difficult. I mean, you know, to, 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 to take that on. Um, but I'm most proud of the, those, those two characters, Father John White and then Lorraine and Lolly, who you'll meet. Lolly was my mom's best friend growing up, by the way. And I use that name in there. My, my grandmother's name is Lorraine. So I really love those. And I put those in there. And those two characters, um, one character, the, the other two, all together. I mean, that was difficult to write because it was just, um, I had never done it. You know, and I had to really put my mind, mind frame into that, um, vo that voice and, and, and everything. And it just put it forward. It was, it was difficult. But um I think it came through okay uh, in the audio book. Peter uh, Burkrat did, did my book, and um, man, he, Peter Peter was in Caddyshack, which is really cool. Oh and yeah, he, love Caddyshack. That was yeah, my like, favorite movie. He, yes, <laughs> he, he's like an extra in it, but but he did he did the audio book for me, and he nailed it. He did a great job. But oh uh, my he, gosh, he, oh that's so amazing. What was your favorite uh, story in the book? Um. I wrote a, a chapter called Sons, and I wrote it in three pieces about um, relationships of sons with their father. And um, I took it from three different vantage points. One guy's a postman, one guy's a coach that wants to talk to his son who's a was a baseball player. Hmm. Um, you, you know, and I, 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 I tried to weave all of them together in a weird way. Um, I actually, you know, submitted that to the Atlantic is almost his own standalone book, like standalone story, which they didn't accept because they, you know, hoity toity Atlantic. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, okay. I, I, wrote I, I wasn't Atlantic. offended. Uh -huh. They wrote me back at least, which was nice. <laughs> but um, the, uh, the, the, that son's chapter is probably my, one of my favorite ones. So if you're a dad and, or you're an uncle, or you're a brother, or you're your son, hope you read it and um, maybe take a little, little something from it. Mm -hmm. we certainly will too and uh, also i was going to ask you this but i think we got sidetracked with all the great stories being in radio new york and everything who are some of your favorite authors and writers growing up yeah so i have many um i i am a big hemingway fan off the bat across the board 
um, Jack Kerouac, William Burroughs, um, a lot of the beat guys. Buka Charles Bukowski is one of my most favorites of all time. Um, and, uh, you know, I was really blessed when, you know, Henry Miller is, you know, a god, you know, he's this, he's this guy. And um, uh, Doug Brinkley, who I don't know if you know Doug, he's a um, presidential historian. He's um, the executor of the, the Hunter S. Thompson estate. He's just like a, he's a big deal. He's a big guy, important person. He's, he's always uh, consulted on different things. He compared me to Henry Miller. Really? And, yeah. And that was, honestly, I, I, I don't deserve that. I am beyond appreciative of him. Um, but he put that into writing. He said, why don't you put that on your book? I think I believe in you. I think you are, you know, and that was a really, uh, so, you know, a guy like Henry Miller, who I love, um, and uh, to have Doug Brinkley say that about my work was pretty cool. So, you know, I had the, the, the whole gamut, right? Doug Brinkley telling me I'm Henry Miller. And then I got Lenny Dykstra telling me, <laughs> that uh, you know, nobody knows better New York. When I was I was prowling the, the city uh, Shea Stadium in center field, Mike King is the great, like, <laughs> so weird thing, you know. Like, um, but uh, again, I'm so happy to to have that uh, kind of thing. But oh yeah, my but gosh, like Miller and all that. Yeah, those, those, are, those are my favorite. Boy, getting an endorsement from Lane Dykstra, that had to be like uh, the cream of the crop. It's like, oh my I gosh, a, I, I I'm a diehard Mets. Are you a Mets fan? Well, no. actually, actually, so I'm, I'm a Cubs fan. I am a Cubs fan, but I still remember that uh, time from 84 up to 85, 86. Brian it went Sandberg, back baby. and forth. Brian yes. Sandberg. And Dwight Gooden for you guys. And oh, yeah. um, Wally Backman, Keith yep. Hernandez. But you know what? I have to say this. Ron Darling was one of my favorites because oh, they were airing pitcher, an yeah. Yeah, they're airing RC commercial in Chicago, which is Royal Crown Cola. RC RC Cola? RC Cola, yes. And yeah, he was I in it. I love RC Cola. <laughs> that, 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 was, that was the cheapest there was. And Pepsi oh, was uh, expensive. Polka was yeah. expensive. You got RC yep. and those shafts that cost like a freaking dime or a nickel for right. a vending machine. <laughs> and, right. and of course, you know, he, he, he was up like this. It's like some people prefer a taste of Pepsi. Ron's like, some people prefer a taste of Coke. Some people prefer a taste of RC. And he was nodding his head says, that was spot on, Ron Darling. <laughs> How about your announcer there, man? The, uh, you know, the glasses. That was oh, nice. Harry Carey. Oh, oh Harry Carey. God, yes. <laughs> you oh, can't beat that, Harry. huh? Harry Carey here, back at the Rockley <laughs> Field. And here right. was a backstory, too, but when he was uh, doing, um, you know, you know, baseball for the St. Louis Cardinals. He right. was drinking Budweiser like crazy. Budweiser. Like, right. you know, during the game. And right. here's little Brock up the plate. And then. <laughs> When he got called to do the Chicago White Sox, he had to do Falstaff beer, but he did not like Falstaff. What it was this Falstaff right. can? It was right. Budweiser. He was drinking that, and he was like, "Screw Falstaff!" And then he is that real? Is that a true story? What's that? <laughs> is that real? Is that a true story? That was a true story. Yeah, and um, <laughs> and somebody was That's telling funny. me that. And the funny part about the Cubs, and um, I remember I was work working at a store in Woodfield Mall, and by the time uh -huh. they're ready to close, it, it was um, Sutcliffe. Rick Sutcliffe throwing the last strike to uh, Sutcliffe's a great pitcher. Oh, he was amazing. 17 yeah, and one yeah. that year. And as one of the pirates goes, Cubs win, Cubs win the revision. Yeah. And we're getting ready to close. Like, Oh, thank God I was working. I get to be in a TV department and watch the Cubs win the division that year. Oh, so that's wild. Oh, Man, so you had some great ball players. The, the Hawk was on that team. And uh, you know, the, the, the Mark Grace and, and just Ron Say and, Oh, God, it's just Ron, so many. Ron said it was amazing. Jody, so many Jody guys, yeah. Davis, Keith Moreland, which I almost caught yeah, a whole Keith run Moreland. from him. Yeah, yeah Moreland. Jody Davis great. behind the plate. Yeah. yeah and, some and, and, I, players. And, I, and I'm trying to think some of the other pitchers on there. I'm trying to think of their um, reliever. But we went to Cubs games, you know, that year. They, um, you know, they, they won the division. And uh, everybody was yeah. saying, oh, they should have won the pennant. But you know something? It was Major League Baseball that screwed them over because the Cubs did oh, yeah. not have lights. And so right. it's like, you know, three games end up in San Diego. They lost. Leon Durham let the ball go with his legs. And Leon Durham, oh, great. Yeah, player. and then Bill Buckner yeah. pulled off the same feet. I think Hernandez <laughs> almost did the same thing, too. It's like first base. Yeah. It's like, boy, that's right. like a graveyard for your career if let your ball go <laughs> through the legs. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, my God, yes. yeah. And, totally. and, and, and I remember that, and I said, it was not the Cubs that was blowing it. San Diego did not get lucky. It was Major League Baseball that screwed them over. It's like, I mean, we we manhandled the Padres in the first two games. and was the third. We, we could have took on the Tigers. That was a much better matchup than the Padres. But you know something? I, I know, I know. Oh, yeah. my God. But fast forward to 2016, it was just like, 
our prayers have been answered. We beat Cleveland four games of three. We're up to like one in the morning watching game seven at a Buffalo Wild Wings. There's a handful of Cub fans, a group of pastors from Cleveland, and they're like, you know, good sports. And it came up and go, hey, great game. I says, God bless you guys. We're going to pray for your Indians to win it next year so they can shut up about not winning. <laughs> yeah. What a wild uh, World Series that was between two teams that were like, hadn't won in 100 years or whatever it was. Oh it's my gosh, yeah. And, and then the Cubs look back and say, it was a good thing on rain delay. We can just calm yeah. down after Chili Davis uh, put the put the Indians up ahead. And that, that would have been like another folklore, but that became ins <laughs> insignificant. And then Indians fans were like, that guy should have been at uh, second base. <laughs> all that. So let me tell you, I, I try to incorporate baseball in my writing all the time. I think that it's just a game of beautiful chance and madness and you never know what's going to happen. I hate people that say it's a slow game. I, I, I think it's, 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 it's just paced, it's paced just right, you know, mm. because it's, it's, you know, you get a little break. You can watch pitches with finesse plays being made. Sometimes there's no score. Sometimes there's tons of runs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't, the home run doesn't, I, I, I doesn't do it for me. Can I ask you uh, one baseball thing? And I know we, we will get off this and get back to the other stuff. Oh, oh absolutely. It's like, I love talking uh, about this stuff. It makes okay. more of an essence of it, but go ahead. I'm, all, I'm all in. All right. I, I, I am a huge believer that Fred McGriff, you know, what Fred McGriff is. I remember. Yeah. Toronto Blue Jays, Atlanta Braves. And, uh, and I'm trying the to think. Play dog. Yes. Crime dog. That's 93 right. 93 home runs. 493 home runs. He's got, I don't know, 2,500 hits, maybe something like that. How is this man not in the Hall of Fame? I have no idea how Jim Rice is 417. I, I love Jim Rice. Put Jim Rice in the Hall of Fame. Fine. But how is Fred McGriff not in the Hall of Fame? How you know, is so Ryan Sandberg in the Hall of Fame over Fred McGriff? Again, Ryan Sandberg should be in the Hall of Fame. But numbers wise, mm -hmm. Fred McGriff, that, I don't get it. You know something? I didn't, I didn't think about this either about Fred McGriff. Yeah. Now you mentioned, I'll do some research. It's maybe because right. the teams were on, the circumstances and whatever else. I'm sure he'll get his due in the Hall of Fame, but you I know, Ryan so. Sandberg, right. And Ryan Sandberg yeah. was understandable. And here's a funny right. story about Ryan Sandberg where he was like 0 for 27 for finally getting a hit and then had a great career. And here, here was a story about with him being on the Phillies. And I mean, the Cubs right. literally stole Ryan Sandberg from the oh, Phillies. They, they had Yvonne yeah. DeJesus. And right. Philly fans were like, oh, we got the Jesus. We're like, right. suckers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. What a bad deal. It was like when the Mets traded Seaver away and got nothing. I mean, they got some bunch of scrubs, basically, from Cincinnati. But oh my anyway, God. I digress. And, yeah. and, of course, you know, with Cincinnati, it's just like, who knew they are going to be, you know, the way they were and everything. He ended up winning, like, right. you know, a World yeah. Series, 75, 76, the big red machine. Oh, my gosh. Right. I still remember that. Yes. Wow. And the Yankees, Reggie Jackson, three home runs. And the last one. Yeah. Went in the uh, third deck, oh. and I had to write a story on that. Just getting the school paper. <laughs> really? Yes. Is it painful uh, to write about the Yankees because I because I hate them. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. And of course, I'm not a big White Sox fan, but you know something? Right. I love I love to have you back on as well too. We'll talk baseball. I got some sure. baseball experts. Yeah, so sounds that. great. That does, that. and and uh, and and also too, like when. You know, of course, with your book as well, too. Maybe just a little baseball story or baseball poem from your book. Or if you wrote one, you can do that, too. It's like, I'm ready for baseball right now. So, oh, it's, yeah, me too. I'm waiting, you know, without spring training around the corner, I'm, I'm confused. To be honest, I wish I am so waiting for them to, to settle this crap and get the, the season going. Exactly. Yeah. And in the meantime, you know, you with baseball and uh, radio yeah. and everything else. Where can we find your book, The Slow Midnight on Cypress Avenue at? Um, yeah, so you can uh, go on Amazon and find it. Barnes and Nobles has it. Um, it's in bookstores and on across the country in some place, little shops and things. I don't know the exact ones, but but definitely but definitely look online. Um, you can find me on Instagram. Um, I'm at at Mike A Figs and um, Mike Figs on Twitter. And uh, yeah, you know you can find me there. You can do all that. Connect with me, please. Happy to, to uh, be a part of it. I have a new book that I've written that I'm, I'm searching for a home for right now to get the right home and get the right development with. And um, this is the, oh, here, here's the actual, the cover for it. Uh, it's a sticker I have made up. Mm -hmm. It's called Finest Flying Without You. Uh, oh, the, yes. You, yeah. you, know, you know something? We'll talk about that in just one minute. Maybe just a sneak peek cool. of the book. You listen to the Mike right. Widener Show at the MikeWidenerShow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. 
Also brought to you by our official sponsor, The Mike Wagner Show, international war ring author Mia Molson Zia Missing, available on Amazon in paperback and ebook. We'll be back with author Mike Figliola of uh, The Slow Midnight on Sapphire's Avenue with his upcoming book after this time. We're back with uh, author Mike Figliola of The Slow Midnight on Cypress Avenue, radio veteran for uh, 30 years on the Mike Wagner Show. Let's talk more about the book, uh, Fine is Flying Without You, maybe just uh, a sneak peek of the book. And this looks really good, too, along with The Slow Midnight. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so this is set in the same literary universe as Cypress Avenue. Uh, it's set in Queens. It's about neighborhood people again. But this one is less about vignettes, sort of like standalone little chapters that give you a glimpse into each character. This one is more about one character and his journey um, from point A to B. The, the thought process for me on this one was, I think everybody goes through a midlife crisis at some point where they wanna leave where they are or test the waters. This is someone that, you know, that's where the fine is flying without you comes from. Hey, you know, I don't need you, I'm going, I'm out of here. And then you realize when you're halfway down the road or more than halfway, I made a mistake, you know, damn, I got to get back to where I was. And so this is the journey of this guy kind of revisiting his past. You know, when you're romanticized sort of when you're younger and say, oh, man, remember when I did this, man, that was great. This is the guy that actually gets to go and revisit it and then realize what the truth of it was. And so that's what I wanted to do, you know, as, as, as a story set in Queens again, set in like the same sort of streets and the subways and, and all that and uh, paint that picture again. So that was, that's what this one's about. And um, I'm hoping for a summer, summertime release. Okay. And, and you say a summertime release, um, you know, sometime in the year as well too. And uh, what else can we, and uh, where can we, what else can we expect from you in 2022 and beyond else, Mike? Oh yeah. I'm hoping, you know, um, so my book, the, uh, the, the, uh, the slow midnight on Cypress Avenue, I'm hoping that um, it, you know, I'm really trying to develop that into either a movie or a TV show. Um, some mutual friends of ours are talking about that. So we'll see where that goes down, down, down the line. Um, but really, I really want to continue writing books. Like that's really what's important to me. I'm happy with my radio and TV career and I want to continue doing that. But at the end of the day, you know, I really love writing books and I hope I can, you know, get the opportunity to look, I'm blessed to, to have someone say, Hey, yes, your book is really good. It needs to be out there. And this one sold very well, thank God. And so, you know, hopefully uh, that translates into something else bigger. And if I can keep writing for the rest of my life, I'll be happy. Mm. And we're certainly looking forward to it. You got some great work, Figs. And uh, who do you consider biggest influence in your career? Oh, boy. Um, biggest influence in my career? I mean, I, I guess it's so varied, Mike. You know, um, rate, there's some things, aspects of radio and baseball and music. music. I mean, I think music affects me the most. Oh, wow. Um, I'm okay. a huge John Lennon guy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like rock music. I like heavier music. I like ambient music. That's really, you know, I, I, something interesting. I'll tell you real quick. I write. And um, when I write, I like to have a lot of stimuli on around me. Music is one of those things I constantly have on. And so it, it could be noir jazz to John Lennon to so a band like Deftones or like something. Oh, wow. Anything. I just like the... The mu music probably what drives my, my writing the most. Mm. Um, and the streets of New York and being among the pe amongst the people. So those oh. two things really, I would say the most influence is music and, and the streets and people in New York. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. And when your new book comes out as well too, Fine is Flying Without, we would love to have you on, talk music and more. So that'd be very interesting. And what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? It's what, something I was told. Don't stop, keep going, uh, keep an ember burning. Like, you know, keep... <laughs> You know, when, when it seems the worst, just keep writing and write for you. Don't ever write for anyone else. Continue going and keep that ember burning. And eventually, look, it took me 20 years to get here, really. Like where, where you know, I've been trying to get published for a long time. I finally wrote the right book and the right person said yes. And so just keep, keep that ember burning. Keep it going. We certainly will do so. And we're looking forward to it. Once again, um, author Mike Figlioli here on the Mike Widener Show at the Slow Midnight on Sapphire Avenue and more. He, uh, your radio veteran for 30 years. It's been great. Mike, a very big thank you for your time. You've been totally amazing. Learned a lot from you. We got to get out some time and uh, share some stories. Looking yeah. forward to having again soon. Make sure you keep us up to date. Keep in touch. We'd love to have you back. And once again, tell us about your upcoming projects. What's your website? How do people contact you? Where can people purchase or check out your book? 
uh, again, so uh, yeah, you can go down, down to Instagram, Mike A. Figs, Twitter, Mike Figs, at Mike Figs. Just check, just Google Slow, Slow Midnight on Cypress and you can find me. And Mike, I, I really appreciate you inviting me to your program. This was a really a lot of fun. You know, I, I didn't know, know your baseball background and different things. So chatting with you was really, uh, was a treat. Thank you so much. Oh, it's amazing too. And of course we got to do it again, where it's like, we have a book out. We'll talk more baseball yeah. music and everything. Sure. And maybe we'll have like um, the Mets and the Cubs in the background. So we'll work on that and maybe get out <laughs> to a ball game. Yeah. Minor leagues are fine too. As we mentioned, Trenton, Staten Island, Coney Island, all that. So we certainly yep. will do so. Yes. <laughs> Once again, figs, a very big, thank you for your time. You've been totally amazing. Learned a lot. Looking forward to having again soon. Make sure you keep us up to date. Keep in touch. We'd love to have you back. We wish you all the best. And you definitely have a great future ahead of you. Oh, thank you, man. It's been a blast. Thank you for having me.